Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm Kevin Banks, the director of the Queen Center for Law in the Contemporary Workplace, and I'm delighted to introduce to you today our Douglas Cunningham visitor, uh, who will give us a distinguished Douglas Cunningham visitor series lecture. Uh, professor Lynn Stout is the Paul Hastings Distinguished Professor of Corporate and Securities Law at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is an internationally recognized expert in the fields of corporate governance, securities regulation, financial derivatives, law and economics, and moral behavior, and the author of numerous articles and books on these topics. Uh, her most recent book is Cultivating Conscience, How Good Laws Make Good People, uh, from Princeton Uni University Press in 2011. Um, Professor Stout has just accepted an appointment as, I believe, the Distinguished Professor of Corporate and Securities Law you got at it. Cornell University, which means she'll be in our neighborhood in the future. And I hope this is the beginning of a fruitful association with Queen's Law. She has uh, many other appointments, perhaps too many to mention at this stage, that qualify her eminently to give us this lecture. And so I will stop there and step aside and let her speak to you. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, uh, and this is a, a talk I like to give, although I do have one question before I get started. How long am I supposed to speak? <laughs> um, as, as long as you like, but typically about 30 to 40 minutes. All right. We're, we're golden. Um, uh, and then leave some time for questioning. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so here is the title of the paper. Um, I think it's a safe guess you're all literate, so you figured out what that is. Um, what the paper does is look at an approach to compensation that's been especially influential in the executive compensation debate that we call optimal contracting. And optimal contracting theory really dominates the present um, uh, discussion of executive compensation. You know, I, I'm hearing, it seems kind of loud. Can we turn it down just a little bit? Thanks. Oh, that's better. Um, really dominates the executive compensation debate. And to understand optimal contracting, you need to understand it's a branch of conventional neoclassical economics. And uh, this is a quick summary of conventional neoclassical economics from Stephen Landberg, um, a, a columnist and economist. You can find some version of this definition of economics in almost any basic economics treatise, including Posner's Law and Economics. Um, and they say that what economics is all about is that people respond to incentives. Fair enough, but uh, before we go any further, I just want to point out that it's very important to treat the idea of incentives with respect. Um, these two authors are not treating the idea of incentives with respect with this book, Spousonomics. They tell you, among other things, that nagging is a really poor incentive. And I would say nagging's not an incentive at all. Nagging is a motivation, or we might say an anti-motivation. It's something that people respond to, but I don't think we should define it as an incentive because if we do, we have just killed off economics and turned it into a circular argument. Because the minute you define incentives as anything people respond to and then turn around and say, oh, and the heart of economics is that people respond to incentives, you've got yourself a nice little tautology. So, I have greater respect for economics. I actually am the co-author of a law and economics casebook, and so I want us to keep the idea of incentives a little bit more pure. And in particular, <laughs> I want us to understand that when we're talking about incentives in most economic analyses, if we're being honest, we're talking about some variation on this incentive, the bag o' money. Um, but more particularly, and I think in some ways, I, I think perhaps the, the greatest contribution I hope to make through this paper is to make people more careful about the word incentives, and in particular to make them understand that when we're discussing optimal contracting theory, we're actually using incentives to mean rewards that have three very important um, characteristics. The first is that an incentive is only an incentive if it's monetary or material. And the reason is only monetary or material rewards are easily legally enforceable. If you promise someone a million dollars a year and you don't pay them, it's pretty easy for them to go to court. If you say to someone, we're going to love, honor, and esteem you, they're going to have a very hard time going to court and getting damages for your failure to do so. So in optimal contracting, where we're talking about legally binding contracts, 
for incentives to be of any value as a contractual mechanism, they have to be monetary or at least material. They have to be something that you can attach. You can attach a monetary value so that you can get damages if you can prove that the promised compensation was not delivered. A second characteristic of optimal contracting is that there is no aversion to so-called high-powered or very, very large incentives. So the difference between $100,000 a year and $100 million a year is that one's sort of medium-powered and the million $100 million is very high-powered indeed. But from an optimal contracting perspective, there's no problem with a very high-powered large compensation package. In fact, it works better as a motivator if you assume people are rational and selfish and adhere to the, con the standard homo economicus model. And finally, the third characteristic of incentives that I think has been overlooked, it's almost taken for granted in the optimal contracting literature to the point where you see virtually no explicit discussion of it, but it turns out to be a very key characteristic, is that incentives have to be determined ex ante. And the reason is, if they're not determined ex ante, you have a situation where you have to worry about one or the other or both of the contracting parties behaving opportunistically. So let me give you an example of an ex post incentive. You work really hard and I'll give you a big reward. The idea is first you have to put in the work and then your employer decides after the fact ex post what the reward will be. Well, the problem with that, deciding what the reward should be ex post, is that it creates obvious incentive for the employer to opportunistically say at the end of the employment period, ah, you didn't do such a great job. I'm going to give you a little bit of money, but I'm not going to give you a lot. And knowing that, of course, any rational and selfish employee would never deliver superior performance in the first place. So the optimal contracting approach assumes away the possibility of trust and trustworthiness. It assumes that both the exact task and the exact compensation for the task have to be completely and fully specified ex ante. Otherwise, the parties will be tempted and indeed won't be tempted, they will succumb to temptation and they will behave opportunistically and the second mover will always refuse to, um, uh, to perform and knowing that the first mover would decline to enter the contract. All right, so this is what incentives really mean in the optimal contracting um, context, not any kind of reward. All right, and the reason why we have to have that narrow definition of incentives is because we're assuming in optimal contracting that the people who are doing the contracting are our classic homo economicus actors who are both perfectly rational and perfectly selfish. Now again, it's very common for economists at this point to jump up and down because they, they realize that when you run around talking about homo economicus as being perfectly selfish, that doesn't necessarily make economists more popular or get them invited to more parties. So, so they tend to jump up and down at this point and say, oh, no, 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 that's not what economics assumes. It simply assumes that people maximize utility. And you can get utility from helping other people and from being altruistic and from being ethical and all these other things. And at that point, I'm not going to make you go through it, but just imagine me pushing this button four times and going back to the tautology slide because it's the same kind of move. Once you start saying that the utility function can be modified to take account of a preference for anything, you have again completely lost the power of economics to make predictions, which is what economics is supposed to be all about. So if I assume that people are primarily selfish, I can predict that if the price of gas rises, people will purchase less gas. If I assume that people are sometimes altruistic, in particular, that people are altruistic toward Exxon shareholders, I can't make predictions anymore. Because if the price of gas goes up, you could actually see altruistic consumers who want Exxon shareholders to make more money buying more Exxon gas. So we've lost the very law of demand. So again, it's very important for us to understand that for economics to work, we have to narrow our view of what motivates people and what they respond to in a fashion that allows us to make predictions. And the conventional narrowness or narrowing is very narrow indeed. And economics in actual application tends to assume explicitly or implicitly 
that people care only about their own material welfare, that we are all Gordon geckos. By the way, I, I'm beginning to worry that some of the younger people in the room may not recognize this individual. Is, do you know who this is? Okay, this is Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street, who is famously known for saying greed is good. Thank you. I'm worried that I'm dating myself here. All right, here is the problem. Or actually, here is the solution. <laughs> um, turns out we are not Gordon Geckos. Um, and I discovered this when I wrote a book on conscience. So here's my book. And I have a note to remind myself of something here. What is it I'm supposed to remind myself? <gasps> oh, yes, buy my book. <laughs> All right. Um, but the origin of the book was when I started moving from the area of securities regulation, where I did most of my initial work, where the homo economicus model, by the way, works really well. I'm not saying that people are never selfish. In some situations, they're predominantly selfish, and securities markets are a really good example of that. But what I found when I moved into corporate governance, and even more so when I joined a board of directors of a mutual fund family and got to see the insides of a corporation, was that the behavior I observed was nothing like homo economicus. In fact, people who acted like that were despised and avoided, and people kept them at arm's length. And in fact, there was far more cooperation within the corporation than, say, the typical law faculty. So this got me very interested in the phenomenon of what is now called in social science prosociality. I use the layman's term conscience. But what it means is people who are behaving as if they care about something other than their own material payoffs, and in particular, as if they care about what happens to other people and they care about following ethical rules. And it turns out there's a whole science of conscience because that's what I did when I wrote this book. I said, this is a really interesting phenomenon. I wasn't taught about it in law school and I didn't use it. It's not in my corporate law case book, but I'm seeing it all around me in the world. Let's go see if I can find some data on it. Well, it turns out the amount of data on prosociality is enormous. It's huge. And if you start approaching this aspect of human behavior from a scientific perspective as opposed to making an assumption, you'll discover that I think no reasonable person can now dispute that the human phenomenon of conscience is omnipresent and very powerful. And here is a wonderful example. There is an experiment called a social dilemma, and it's related to a prisoner's dilemma, except it's played by more than two people. But essentially, in a classic social dilemma, what you do is you bring a bunch of people into a room, and you allow them to make a choice. Now, actually, frequently these days, they work really hard to make sure that the players don't see each other and are playing anonymously um, so that there's no reputational concerns involved. So you bring people into a room and then you separate them in cubicles and have them play at computer terminals and they're essentially asked to make a choice. They can make a choice that will maximize their own personal payoffs while reducing payoffs to every other member of the group or they can make a choice that allows them to make slightly less money but all the other members of the group make more money. Um, by the way, uh, how many of you are familiar with The Prisoner's Dilemma? Good, OK. I mean, at, at this point, it's, it's something that most people get exposed to at one point or another. But the interesting thing about a prisoner's dilemma, of course, is that when everyone behaves selfishly, you all collectively end up worse off than if you had all unselfishly cooperated. But from an individual perspective, no matter what everybody else does, you'll always be better off being the selfish bastard. That's a technical term. Um, so what do we find in these experiments? Well, what we find is really interesting. The homo economicus model predicts that in these experiments, you would get 0% cooperation in a social dilemma, meaning no one would cooperate with the group. Everyone would rationally and selfishly pursue their own material welfare, maximize their own payoffs, meaning that they all collectively get worse off. In fact, what we find over and over is that a substantial proportion of people cooperate up to 97%. I'm going to look at my watch. Oh, I better hustle a little. Um, 97% is a lot of people making sacrifices for the group. And at that point, I think we have to say this is a real phenomenon, and it's a pretty common one. Um, but what's interesting to me is that we're going from less than 5% to 97%. And that doesn't seem to be dependent on the nature of the subjects who are participating in the experiment. I could take you 
and stick you in an experiment, and the odds are very good that I could get as few as 5% of you to cooperate and as many as 97% of you to cooperate. So it's not a matter of good apples or bad apples or cooperators and defectors. It's the same people who are responding to something, not economic payoffs, but something that's making them act like this. And so um, I have a chapter in my book called The Jekyll Hyde Syndrome. And it's actually pretty interesting. You will see the same people in some situations behave very cooperatively and ethically and then turn around and walk into another situation and they'll behave completely asocially and focus only on their own payoffs. And this switch is so dramatic it shows up on brain scans. You're actually using different parts of the brain when you're making pro-social decisions as opposed to purely selfish decisions. Okay, this is really interesting, but it isn't useful <laughs> until we get the ingredients to Dr. Jekyll's potion, right? And we can figure out what's going on that's making the switch. And so that was actually what the chapter, The Jekyll Hyde Syndrome, is about. What are the ingredients of the potion? And there are innumerable factors, non-economic factors, that seem to make a difference in people's willingness to be pro-social. One study has found that people are nicer when they're playing a game and there's a dog in the room. <laughs> but there are three variables in particular that, are, that are, have been demonstrated over and over to have really significant effects on behavior and which are also a little bit easier for policymakers to manipulate than making everybody get a dog. Um, and these three variables that I identified, and to do this I had to literally read hundreds, maybe over a thousand studies to look for patterns, and then I found like about a dozen meta-surveys to confirm the patterns. And the patterns are also, they line up very neatly with the basic social psychology and developmental psychology literature with some really well understood and, and very um, uh, well accepted characteristics of human behavior. And if you, if you look at the big picture, what you'll swiftly conclude, or at least what I swiftly concluded, was that there were three variables in particular that seemed to be especially important in determining whether people were pro-social or asocial. And I'm, I've listed these three variables under this label, social context. And what are they? Well, the first one is, guess what? People tend to do what a respected authority tells them to do. And we know from Stanley Milgram's infamous electric shock experiments at Yale that you can instruct people to harm other people. That's the bad news. The good news is you can tell people to be nice and cooperative, and they will respond to that. Um, now, there's a caveat there, and it really applies to all three. Um, people only respond to instructions from authority that they respect, that they view as an in-group authority to which they owe allegiance. And similarly, they only imitate the behavior of other in-group members, and they only care about the magnitude of benefits to in-group me members. So it's important to bear in mind that the caveat here is that when I'm talking about pro-social behavior, whether or not you can trigger it depends a lot on the person's individual definition of who is in their society. That's kind of bad news, but the good news is that humans, especially humans in developed nations, seem to have extraordinarily plastic views of who is in their society. We are willing to embrace not only people of different genders, colors, ages. We become attached to chihuahuas. We become attached to favorite cars and computers. It's a fascinating element of human behavior that it turns out our capacity to love <laughs> is really remarkably unpicky. So the result is that when you do a typical experiment, pretty much everyone involved Involve, regards everyone else in the, in the experiment as a member of their in-group. That's just the way developed economies seem to work, and perhaps we should all be grateful. Okay, so number one, people do what authority tells them to do. Number two, people do what other people are doing. So if everyone around you is littering and throwing their chewing gum wrappers on the floor, you're going to throw your chewing gum wrapper on the floor. But if everyone else is carrying their litter and the floor is spotless, you are probably not going to be the per first person to drop your chewing gum wrapper on the floor. Um, and finally, interestingly enough, we're intuitive utilitarians. So when we're deciding whether or not to sacrifice, we pay attention to the size of the social benefits from the sacrifice. So the example I like to use is if I were in a rush and someone stopped me to ask for directions, I might excuse myself and say I didn't have time to help them. 
But if I were in a rush and someone fell down next to me from a heart attack, you know that I would stop, and so would you, to dial, what is it, 911? Yeah. Thank you. And, and uh, get them help. So uh, we tend to be more pro-social when we recognize the stakes are high. But it's, <laughs> it's very important to bear in mind that to say that people are capable of acting like Dr. Jekyll, because he's the nice one, when the social context supports nice behavior, doesn't mean that Mr. Hyde disappears. Mr. Hyde is always lurking underneath to the extent that, that um, uh, I love the way George Washington, the founding father of America, of course, put it this way. He said, few men have the honor to withstand the highest bidder. Franklin Raines, the former CEO of, of I think it was Freddie Mac, or, um, who has been, uh, was being investigated, put it a different way. He said, you wave enough money in front of, good, in front of them and good people do bad things. Um, but one of the most important things to bear in mind is that even though most of us are capable of being pro-social, our pro-sociality breaks down in the face of very big temptations. So I'm going to paraphrase Oscar Wilde. We can resist small temptations. It's the big ones that do us in. That should not lead us to conclude that this phenomenon is unimportant because sometimes my resisting a small temptation produces enormous benefits for other people. So I like to use the example um, someone stole a laptop computer out of the back of a car of a, um, a mutual fund portfolio manager on the West Coast a couple years ago. And the computer contained all of the personal information of all of the shareholders of the mutual fund. The costs of trying to straighten out that mess were enormous, measuring in the tens of millions of dollars. Presumably, the person who stole the computer was only able to resell it probably for less than a couple hundred. If that person had resisted that small temptation, it would have produced enormous benefits for others. And we see this imbalance on a fairly routine basis. Lots of times, modest restraint on my part produces enormous collective social benefits. All right. So the other thing to bear in mind, though, is that um, it turns out there are some people who behave selfishly even when the social context says, be pro-social and we call them sociopaths or psychopaths. And they are estimated to account for one to 3% of the population. And they're a very real threat to the rest of us and often very hard to detect. Another interesting thing about this project is I've actually learned a lot about psychopaths. It's kind of cool. Um, a reduced version of this is that even though 97% of us are capable of being pro-social, there are differences in our proclivities to shift into Mr. Hyde or Dr. Jekyll mode. And so some people are more inclined toward prosociality, especially in an ambiguous social context, than others are. Um, do I have time? I'm going to take it anyway. Um, interestingly enough, you might ask yourself, where do these proclivities, we'll call them character, come from? The best data so far suggests that your tendency toward prosociality is the result of habit and experience. And there was a fabulous um, experiment run by some anthropologists um, who got money from the MacArthur Foundation, and they went out to 14 non-Western, non-market economies. So I, th these were economies they'd never heard of. Did you know there are Torgud nomads in Mongolia? Did you know there are Machaguinga subsistence farmers in the rainforest? How about Orma cattle herders in Kenya? And this is my favorite, Lamalera whale hunters in Indonesia. I had no idea there were whale hunters in Indonesia. It turns out when you run these social dilemmas and other tests on these people, guess what? None of them are homo economicus. But there are really interesting differences. So the Machiguenga are the most selfish, and they only cooperate 24% of the time. And the Orma of Kenya are the least selfish. They cooperate almost 60% of the time. They actually beat out Americans, who are usually pretty high. And they, uh, the experimenters run, ran a whole bunch of variables to see if they could come up with some correlations, try and find the variables that seem correlated with higher or level, lower levels of pro-sociality in that particular culture. And they found that all the individual variables were weak or irrelevant, you know, gender, age, that sort of thing. But what really seemed to make a difference was the nature of the economy itself. So if it was an economic system that involved a lot of exchange and a lot of cooperation for production, you got people who cooperated a lot in social dilemmas. So the Lamalera whale hunters, just try catching a whale by yourself. Cooperate a lot. Whereas the Machiguenga, who are pretty independent, they're subsistence farmers who don't do a lot of market exchange, don't cooperate much at all. 
So it seems that Aristotle was right all along. If you think of prosociality as a virtue, it is a virtue that is acquired by habit. All right, so now that we've got the basic tool a uh, sort of alternative model of human behavior. I think of it as an extension or an elaboration on the homo economicus model. What does it tell us about optimal contracting? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that optimal contracting is almost an oxymoron. Anyone who teaches contracts will tell you. Um, who teaches contracts here? Is there anybody? Yay! Well, you'll, all contracts are incomplete, aren't they? In other words, you, it is impossible to fully specify in advance what the parties would like to agree to do in the event result or in the event of anything that could possibly occur in the contracting process. But some contracts are more complete than others. And employment contracts, especially for relatively high level employment positions that involve the exercise of a lot of discretion on the employee's part, are really, really incomplete. So this contract on the left is an employment contract. It's actually a contract that was written on a napkin to hire a, uh, an actress to star in a, an internet YouTube zombie movie. There's the zombie movie employment contract. The contract on the right is also a really common form of contract favored by CEOs. And I am referring here to an empirical study by Randall Thomas at Vanderbilt and Stuart Schwab at Cornell that found that one third of the CEOs, Fortune 500 CEOs, have no written employment contract at all. And the other third have a really bare bones contract that simply says, this is your salary, these are your options. And the remainder have a contract that might run two or three pages and it includes a few little added details like you can be fired for moral turpitude. It is shocking just how incomplete executive contracts are. And I think that's no coincidence. It's not that these are people who can't contract over something because once you hire them, they spend large portions of their day negotiating contracts. Just both the employer and the employee in the corporate executive context recognize that optimal contracting is not, it's an illusion. It can't really be effectively done. All right. So here is the problem with optimal with sorry with incomplete contracting. Um, oops. It leaves enormous room for opportunistic behavior because if you don't fully specify what the executive is going to do but you specify some of his pay, say he gets a million dollar salary, there's a real temptation for him to just dawdle for a year, take the million dollars and go away and say, well, you know, I didn't work very hard, but that's a pretty good million. Um, and similarly, there's an incentive on the part of the employer. If the executive does a great job, works his heart out, um, there's an incentive at the end of the year or the five years or the 10 years or whatever the employment period is to renege on the deal and say, Nope, you're not going to get, you know, we've, we've found an excuse not to pay your pension. We've decided your performance was subpar even though we've made tons of money. We're not going to pay you. How do you guard against the incredible opportunities for opportunism, if I might say that, that are presented by highly incomplete contracts? Well, in the conventional law and economic story, there's no way to do it other than to rely on reputation. And so you say the reason why people who are in relational contracts, like um, employment contracts, don't exploit the gaps in the contracts is because they're afraid they'll acquire a bad reputation, which will harm their future opportunities. But reputation can only take you so far. There are lots of situations where that's not a very satisfactory answer for how incomplete contracting can work. For example, it doesn't work at the end game. As you're approaching retirement, you would expect them to loot the company and head for the hills. But in fact, that's pretty unusual. It's usually the young ones that loot the company and head for the hills. Um, it, you can't understand how people hire young executives because they don't have a reputation yet. So you're taking an enormous chance. And finally, reputation only works when outside observers can detect which one of the parties is at fault. And in the executive contracting area, absent some sort of fraud, that's really hard to do. So for example, remember when Mark Hurd was fired from Hewlett Packard? We still don't know. Did Mark Hurd screw up or did Hewlett Packard, Packard screw up? So reputation's really kind of weak. But here's something you might also use to fill in the gaps in the contract. Your counterparty's conscience. If you can find, if an executive can find a board of directors and a board of directors can find an executive, both of whom are willing to approach this process from a pro-social Dr. Jekyll perspective and say, you know what? We agree that 
part of our deal is that we will treat each other fairly and decently. Then, when new things arise, it's the conscience of your counterparty that allows you to resolve the dispute instead of the two of you turning on each other and going for each other's throats. Um, but of course, now that we know how conscience works, we understand that if you want to use conscience to fill the gaps in an incomplete contract, there's a couple of things you have to do. Um, the first thing you have to do is that you have to make sure that the social context surrounding the negotiation of that contract is one that supports pro-social behavior. And there's actually an interesting story I tell in the book about how the implied contractual term of good faith can be understood as a sort of exhortation by judicial authority that in certain kinds of contract negotiations, the parties are supposed to take account of each other's welfare and not behave purely opportunistically. Um, the other, another thing you have to do is make sure that in the contracting process, um, each side perceives the other as pro-social. So this is one of the, you know, and of course every, every, uh, every business lawyer, not every business lawyer, but every business person knows that when the first thing you do is you show up to a negotiation with two lawyers and two inches of contract, that's not the best foot to get started on. Doesn't work too well in marriages either, I hear. So uh, for similar reasons, because you're showing that you expect the other person to be entirely selfish, which suggests that you view it as a relationship in which selfishness is appropriate. Um, and of course, there have to be benefits um, to, from pro-sociality. So not surprisingly, relational contracts um, may, uh, may be inclined to break down in situations where there isn't room for both parties to benefit. It becomes a zero-sum game. Um, but a really critical factor we should always bear in mind is even if you set up the social context of your contract so it supports pro-sociality, if the economic context creates huge temptations, you have to worry. And I actually think this is one of the biggest problems with executive compensation and Fortune 500 companies. Fortune 500 companies control tens of trillions of dollars. That is an enormous pool of assets. And if you draft an executive compensation contract that gives an executive even the slightest chance of getting a piece of those tens of trillions of dollars through unethical or illegal behavior, you are creating an enormous temptation. And by the way, one of the sad things about temptation is that once people succumb to it, they tend to be more willing to behave unethically again in the future due to the phenomenon called cognitive dissonance. It's a, a truism among experts in white collar crime that no one, or very few people, the, the, you know, the, the one to two percent say, I wanna grow up to be a white collar criminal. Most of the other people who become white collar criminals wanted to be successful business people. And what happens is, faced with a very difficult situation, maybe a really bad quarter's earnings, they say to themselves, well, if I just commit a little bit of securities fraud, it's really not gonna hurt anybody because we'll be able to reverse it in the next quarter and then no one will ever know. And in the meantime, the company will keep going and the employees will keep their jobs. And then before you know it, you've got Enron. So it's that, uh, that dreadful phenomenon. Once people give in to temptation, they're going to be more and more likely to succumb to it. Um, and finally, the last thing you want to do, uh, so the first thing you want to make sure your contract supports conscience. You want to make sure that there are no big temptations that will suppress or kill off conscience. And finally, you want to make sure that you're negotiating with someone who is homo sapiens and not that Gordon Gecko person who doesn't have a conscience. And uh, Richard Epstein at Chicago puts it beautifully. He says, when you're drafting a business contract, you pick the partner first and draft the contract second. And that's exactly right. There's this interesting dance that often goes on in the business world, I think. And I've seen the dance go on where people are testing to see whether the counterparty to a contract is someone they would view as honorable, a, you know, a good guy, someone they can work with, or whether they are a jerk or Often the word is slightly less flattering than jerk. Um, okay, so in this world where we're seeking to use conscience to fill in highly incomplete contracts, what does paying people for performance do? Well, it turns out the answer is nothing very good. Um, first of all, it changes the social context in a way that inevitably suppresses pro-sociality. Because first of all, when you are using an incentive contract, you're basically telling someone, I expect you to be selfish. That's the equivalent of saying, it's okay for you to be selfish. 
So authority is saying selfishness is fine in this context. Um, if you have an employment environment where there are a lot of incentive contracts, everyone will figure out that everyone else is expected to be selfish too, which will lead them to conclude that since everyone else is being selfish, they should behave selfishly. And finally, pay for performance clearly signals that you're being selfish is beneficial to the group because why would we pay you for it? If we're rewarding you to do something, presumably that's because it benefits your employer. And so you're sending the signal that greed is indeed good. Um, pay for performance, especially the way it's done in the business world context, creates enormous temptations. And I've focused on how this is especially true in Fortune 500 companies. Interestingly, I got a great question from someone at Syracuse who basically said, how would this apply to startups? And I said, you know, I'm much less worried about pay for performance in startups. And the reason is there's no bank to rob. What makes a startup a startup is that it doesn't have a lot of money. <laughs> there really aren't a lot of temptations. So I, I've, you know, I'm going to add a paragraph to the paper where I basically say, you know, you shouldn't read from this paper that pay for performance is always bad, but you certainly can take the message it's really bad in enormous Fortune 500 companies where executives are given control over hundreds of billions of dollars and they are consequently facing temptations in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and finally, um, when you have a system that's based on pay for performance, you are creating a workplace that is relatively attractive to the Gordon Geckos and relatively unattractive to the Dr. Jekylls. And you're going to get a selection bias. You're going to attract homo economicus. And by the way, I think there's a lot of this going on in the hedge fund world. Some of my best friends are hedge fund managers. But I think, I actually, it was, it was hilarious. Um, I, I wrote a little op-ed in the Harvard Business Review electronic version. And the title was, Are Hedge Funds Criminogenic Environments? And I got a lot of hate mail from hedge fund managers. But their objections took two forms. Objection number one was, you can't prove it. <laughs> and objection number two is, everybody's like this. Right? Which is, by the way, one of those cognitive dissonance rationalizations that can be so handy. And it was interesting. Nobody said, oh, no, you're wrong. We're all highly ethical. <laughs> so I thought that spoke volumes. And of course, that's because the hedge fund world is ideal for a sociopath. Because by breaking the rules, you can make a ton of money. And the problem is, once you get enough people who are asocial, it, you reach a tipping point, and you start driving out the pro-social people. You drive them out because they're at a competitive disadvantage. You know, when you reward the hedge fund manager that makes the most profits, and it turns out he made them through insider trading, the managers who don't inside trade are at a disadvantage, so they leave. Um, you uh, you uh, lose the whistleblowers because the fewer pro-social people, the less, likelihood, like, less likely it is there's someone in the hedge fund who might squeal on you to the SEC. And uh, you're also changing the social context again, because when everybody is increasingly going in the criminal direction, that tells you criminality is all right. Hence all those hedge fund managers telling me that everybody does it. Um, all right, so pay for performance, it turns out, can be really dangerous, especially in exactly the context where it's been pushed most heavily, which is executive compensation in the United States. Pushed so heavily that I actually trace its dominance in part, maybe primarily, to a change in the tax law in 1993 that required corporations to tie executive pay to objective performance metrics. And it was a, quote, reform of tax law and corporate law that was driven by people who believed in optimal contracting, and I like to think sincerely believed they thought that by requiring corporations to tie executive pay to performance, you'd get better corporate performance all I can say is, how is your retirement? How are your retirement savings doing these days? So I, we did this enormous natural experiment. It has not generated an improvement in investor returns. If anything, they've declined. It has not generated an improvement in corporate performance compared to prior decades. It has certainly produced anecdotally a daisy chain of scandals and disasters and the near collapse of Wall Street. Um, and I think it's time for us to rethink whether in light of both that evidence and this theory, that was such a good idea. Maybe we ought to look to alternatives. And what would those alternatives be? Well, the very theory of what pay for performance is about and why it can be problematic tells you the kinds of reforms you want to go to. 
So one thing you want to do is you want to start emphasizing possibly non-material and non-monetary rewards, in part because they don't crowd out pro-sociality nearly as badly by altering the social context to favor selfishness. Indeed, some, and so what do I mean by non-material rewards? The usual sorts of things. You get the best parking space. You get the employee of the month plaque. You are honored at a dinner. You get a key to the executive washroom. The interesting thing about these things is that because they've emphasized relative status, they may actually make people more sensitive to the interests of others instead of less. And uh, you know that may be one of the reasons why. Oh, and by the way, and they're also really cheap, right? So even an economist, if they work, why on earth would you not use them? Um, secondly, I'm become a huge fan. You know, deans love me. I'm a huge fan of low-powered incentives, and I've I've reached the conclusion that the idea that you need to pay people enormous amounts of money to get optimal performance out of them is just wrong. As long as they like what they're doing and as long as they feel that their contributions are respected and valued, the money beyond a certain point rapidly becomes a very severely diminishing marginal utility. In the meantime, the money does start creating these eventually possibly overwhelming temptations. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, of large pay. Um, I think, and it's not because I'm not a capitalist or anything. I love capitalism. And you know, I try to stay out of the inequality fight. This is an efficiency argument. If you pay people enormous amounts of money, they'll do things that are destructive of wealth. OK. Um, and finally, and uh, I think very interestingly, um, another recommendation is that we need to recognize that you can give rewards ex post. So when I say I'm not in favor of pay for performance incentives, that doesn't mean I'm not in favor of compensating people. I mean, nobody's going to work very long for free, right? But compensation should not be confused with incentives. Incentives have those three characteristics. Compensation includes non-monetary rewards, low-powered rewards, and it especially includes ex post rewards. And in fact, what that suggests is that you can actually increase and promote pro-social behavior within a contracting relationship through a reiterative process where you give the executive a nice salary and say, work hard and we'll reward you. The executive relies and makes themselves vulnerable by working hard. At the end of the period, the employer comes back and said, you did, you know, you were trustworthy, we're going to reward you even more. Now show you're still trustworthy. The executive goes out and works again. And what happens is the interpersonal trust gets built up to the point where you have a terrific performance despite a highly incomplete contract. And by the way, interestingly enough, um, there was an article in the Columbia Law Review last fall by um, uh, Ron Gilson, uh, Chuck Sobel, and Bob Scott at Columbia, at least two of whom are very conventionally law and economics types, where they describe this process in supply contracts. They call it braided contracting. They're not talking about exec comp, but they're looking at it in a commercial context and exploring how it seems to be, as an empirical matter, incredibly common in the business world. And certainly, it's incredibly common in the employment world, because I think I'm done. Because those of you who have as many wrinkles as I do are probably looking at this and saying, this looks really familiar. Why? Because this is what businesses used to do with executives. It's exactly what they did, in particular, before the 1993 tax code changes. Those keys to the washrooms, those corner offices, those jets. By the way, I love corporate jets. Do you have any idea how much cheaper a corporate jet is than $200 million in stock options? And your CEO gets there faster? I don't understand the corporate jet prejudice thing. I mean, from a pure economic perspective, they're fabulous. So anyway, you have these non-monetary incentives. The pay was very low powered. The average executive before 1993, average Fortune 500 executive, earned a total package under a million dollars, which is laughable today. I think we're up to 20. And the, the ratio between executive comp and average worker comp was something like 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. Now it's 300 or 400 to 1. So, you know, we certainly got great results with those relatively low powered in, uh, incentives. And rewards were chronically determined ex post by boards of directors. They did exactly that process. They would hire people, give them a flat salary, say at the end of the year we'll give you a bonus, depending on what we think the results are. At the end of the year, the directors would give them the bonus, maybe a little raise, the executive would come back again. This is exactly what the business world did.
suggesting to me that business people left to their own devices are actually pretty good intuitive behavioral economists and that we should pay attention to what they have to tell us. We should pay attention to what the business world has to tell us academics about what might be truly optimal contracting. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. That's pretty good. One, I can see why deans love you. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrific talk. Thank you so much. I've got two questions. You mentioned that uh, pro-social behavior is more common in developed countries than in developing countries. So I'm just curious to, as to why that is the case. And second, yeah. uh, the alternatives to incentives. If this is the case, you would expect that firms that understand alternatives and incentives being better results mm -hmm. would we start to crowd out the firms mm -hmm. that don't understand mm -hmm. that. But we mm -hmm. don't see that, or at least... Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. So, so on the first point, I don't mean to suggest, what I, what I meant was that people in developing companies, see, developing countries tend to have wider views of who is in their in-group. It doesn't mean they're necessarily more pro-social toward those in their in-group. It just means, you know, you, if you've been around the block a few times, I just think it's the experience of being around the block a few times. I, I think that um, if you are brought up in a culture where you don't tend to think of other people as potential trade partners, you tend to think of them as outgroup members. And just because of the nature of the culture, I mean, another really interesting thing is, this is, there's no evidence, this is just my sheer speculation, but it fascinates me, the di cultural differences I see in seaports as opposed to land-based economies. And people in the Mediterranean, people in the Baltics, people up in the Shetland Islands. I mean, it was amazing. I went up to the Shetland Islands once, and they were like among the most cosmopolitan people I'd ever seen. Because, you know, people were constantly dropping in on ships from all over the world. So, uh, you know, I think, I really think it, it is, Aristotle was right. And if you're in the habit of dealing with people who seem different from you on an equal footing and on a cooperative basis, that carries over to a very plastic notion. The more commercialist society, perhaps the more pro -social Yes, that yes, that was actually the finding. The that, yes, society. that was the yeah. finding of the MacArthur Group, that, that proper capitalism, yeah. as opposed to kleptocracy, Proper capitalism actually promotes prosociality. Yeah, so it's a you know this is a this is not an anti-capital mess anti-capitalist message in, in any way shape or form. Now your second question, which was really interesting, but I've forgotten it. Oh, you think that firms have recognized this? <laughs> oh, they are crowding it. Yeah. One of the most interesting phenomena that you can see is that executives in closely held or privately controlled corporations are not paid as highly as executives in public corporations. Compensation and pri it is only public corporations that are subject in the United States, at least, to the Internal Revenue Code rules. Private corporations are not. There's two consequences of that. Um, well, I don't know if they're consequences. There's two correlations with that. Correlation number one is that executives in family-controlled or privately held companies are not paid as much. Correlation number two, which is really interesting, is that the number of public firms in the United States is steadily decreasing. Eight years ago, there were some like eight, according, Grant Thornton just came out with a uh, study on this. There were almost 9,000 publicly listed companies in US stock exchanges. It's now down to only slightly over 5,000. So the pool of public, so I would say that in fact, we're already seeing this. We're seeing that the competitive pressures are actually hurting public corporations collectively as a business form. Um, here. Okay. Question about um, whether you would classify profit sharing as following uh, falling under the same kind of paper performance like profit sharing, where you, it's across the board of the entire. No, 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 no. Because of course it's not individualistic. Okay. <laughs> and and in fact, the great thing about profit sharing is that it may actually have the opposite effect right. and reinforce that sense of we're all in this together. Do it for the team. It may in fact do a wonderful job of promoting pro sociality. So Moving from paper performance at just the executive level to introducing yeah. more profit sharing plans. Well, a lot of companies actually are focusing on that, and and I don't have any data. There's a really interesting book coming out by Marjorie Kelly called Owning Our Future, where um, she's actually working on the same hypothesis that the public corporation, for various reasons, is starting to look 
not so great as a business form and that there are these new forms springing up including cooperatives and she focuses very much on profit sharing and how it seems to actually generate pretty successful business results but that's I mean that's very anecdotal but certainly the theory suggests this is a potentially terrific direction to go in thank you that's actually worth making a note and trying to remember yeah thank you um, Paul so I have a couple questions. One is, it seems to me the debate over pay for performance is focused on how we reward performance. And I think that's an important part of the um, important piece of the puzzle concerning the impact of executive compensation on conscious and corporate law. But I wonder about how we measure performance itself. Like, what are the performance standards? And it seems to me sort of tricky to see. I mean, you might curtail um, rewards in such a way to make room for conscience, but unless you reward conscience in some way in the way in which you measure the performance of executives and employees, it's a question whether or not there really is space for conscience in corporate life. That's one, yeah. one question. The other goes to um, a sort of another contextual question, and that goes to the signaling function of corporate law itself in telling directors and officers what they can do and yeah. should do. Yeah. And the story I hear often about Delaware corporate law is the sort of gradual erosion of standards of fiduciary duties imposed on directors mm -hmm. and officers. So there was a robust duty of care, mm -hmm. now there's a weak duty of care. Mm -hmm. The business judgment rule is something that's mm -hmm. more or less recent in the sense that it seemed to have arisen in the early 80s. So isn't it possible that unless we have performance standards that suggest conscience is important, unless we have corporate law suggesting mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. conscience is important, the Conscience might be killed off anyway, or yeah, killed, yeah. killed off a long time ago. And, and no, absolutely. And, and that's where I want to go back to just sort of reemphasize. When I am saying that I am not a big fan of incentives in complex contracting, that is not the same thing as saying I'm not a big fan of rewards. Um, because if you don't reward people, they're, pros they're going to become, you're not acting like an in group member. If they work hard and you don't reward them, you're actually going to be suppressing conscience. So this is a patented Lynn Stout quote, right? Um, when you take from each according to their ability and give to each according to their need, you end up with lots of needy and competent people. I discovered that as a student in a food cooperative. I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, so, so what I'm arguing for is the use of rewards. So yes, I agree with you. I mean, and that's why, that's why conventional communism didn't work. You know, if you don't reward people for working hard, Eventually, they figure they're just being exploited by the people who aren't working hard. Um, you know, I'm not an, an entirely unrelieved Ayn Rand fan, but she's got a great little story she tells of the 20th century electrical motor company in Atlas Shrugged, which should be, I think, required reading for, for all students. Don't worry, I also require them to read Dr. O's The Waterworks, which is sort of the anti-capitalist screed, right? Um, but it, it really is true. If, if people are rewarded for being parasites, you're going to get a lot of parasites. You know, so that's, you know, we call it evolution, common sense, whatever you want. Um, so, oh, but back to fiduciary duties. Um, I'm fascinated. I actually think the perception that fiduciary duties are being eroded in the United States is just dead wrong. And the best case, it was fascinating to me, the business judgment rule is... There's a case, and I can't remember the name of it, it's an 1890s U.S. Supreme Court case, and it's cited by Einer L. Howe in a 2005 article in the New York Law Review called um, Sacrificing Profits for, I can get you the site, but, but this case is fascinating. What happened was the directors of the Oakland Water Company, a for-profit corporation, refused to raise water rates to the Oakland municipal services, the firefighters and the schools. And a shareholder sued, saying that that was a failure to maximize shareholder value. And the Oakland uh, Water Corporation said, we're not out here to do that. We're out here to keep Oakland a thriving city. And the Supreme Court said, that's the business judgment rule. So, you know, it's interesting to me. I don't actually see any, you know, if you, when I go back and read the cases, the business judgment rule was, if anything, tougher before 1986. Everyone was shocked by Smith versus Van Gorkum because it was the first case where a director who actually went to board meetings, <laughs> you know, had been held liable. So, uh, so I would actually disagree with that. But, but, but I would agree with the part that says, yes, one of the lessons of this is that a vital function of the courts is to 
try and support director prosociality not by imposing sanctions, but by using that message of authority. And there's another great article by Ed Rock, oh, which I can, Saints and Sinners is in the title, where he talks about Delaware Chancery opinions as being morality sermons unaccompanied by any actual finding of legal responsibility. So yeah, it does, it does fit in neatly with that idea of fiduciary duty being supported primarily through exhortation as opposed to the imposition of sanctions. Yes? Does this line of thought have a, a, maybe a power to kind of trickle down from the executive levels to help companies deal with some of the, the fiscal problems they're dealing with and you know, finding alternative ways to pay their employees, to motivate their employees with, but on a tight budget? Like, oh. Absolutely. You know, what's, what's hilarious is, to me is human resources people, at least that's what we call them in the States, what do you call them, HR people? They know all this stuff already. This is their bread and butter. <laughs> I mean, so, so when you talk to them, they're constantly doing things like that, and they're administering surveys. I mean, the good ones are. They're administering surveys to their employees saying, what do you want? And one of the things they find over and over is that one of the best rewards for an employee is to feel like they are able to do a good job and the business supports them in doing a good job. There, there seems to be this tremendous um, positive reinforcement for most of us from a feeling of mastery. And so smart corporations take advantage of that. And Google is, just, you know, I don't think the people in Google did what they did because of their stock options. I think the people at Google did what they did because they felt honored to be, because they were honored to be hired by Google. They liked the free snacks and the, you know, they, I mean, Google got people to work 24-7, and it wasn't by dangling money in front of their noses. This is one of their office spaces. I mean, it's crazy what they have in here. We, we both in a past life, I, I did a real estate deal with Google, yeah. and when we moved into Kitchener-Waterloo in Ontario, they've got slides and ping pong tables. I know, and, and rock and climbing and walls and skateboard things, and yep. So, and, and all of those are way cheaper than $200 million in stock options. I take it from the presentation that you assume that either you would have to put a prohibition against pay for performance in order to stop this as oh. an activity because we're already so ingrained. Yeah, you have hit the, oh boy, have you hit the hard question. Now that the genie is out of the bottle, what can we do? I mean, one thing I think is really easy is we should repeal section 162 of the tax code. I mean, to me, that's like a no-brainer. I have never seen an instance yet where the involvement of government bureaucrats and academics in setting compensation has produced better results. And I don't see any evidence that this was an exception. By the way, and isn't it interesting, government bureaucrats and academics generally don't have their pay tied to much of anything. <laughs> so I find it very interesting that they assume that you can't get business people to do a good job unless you dangle money in front of their noses where they themselves you know, it's a very indirect connection. Um, but, but that's a great question. I don't know the answer. I believe you are correct to be cynical. Can we go back? Particularly because in some of these industries, we've had such a self-selection for the relatively asocial, they now control the business. And I can see them fighting mightily to get rid of the pay for performance connection because now they view it as a great opportunity to line their own pockets. So I, I, let me think about that. But if I had a silver bullet, I would share it. But that's, a, that's an excellent, and, uh, and I'm afraid I haven't really answered the question. But I will acknowledge it as a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Do you think stay on pay will have any impact? Oh, I think it's so, oh. Well, it's, OK, now you're running into another area. I hate shareholder democracy. I really, you know, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a conservative, although conservatives claim me. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just, I think of myself as being in the reasonable middle. And if you look at the data on shareholder involvement in public corporations, there's no data it produces a better result, quite the contrary. And so the problem with say on pay is it's gonna do, it's gonna become the tool of the hedge funds, just like every other expansion of shareholder democracy has become a tool of the hedge funds. And they're going to use it to beat executives about the head so they will do share repurchases and corporate spinoffs and other things that temporarily raise share price. But that does not relate to this topic. So let me think about your question <laughs> in this context. If I could put that visceral hatred of say on pay aside, can I see any merit to it? Possibly, yes. 
because it does, it does, so if nothing else, it reminds executives that they are supposed to be accountable to something other than themselves. So yeah, it, I mean, you know, because of all those other problems, I can't say I'm a fan, but on this area, it might produce improvement. Yeah. There was actually someone behind you. Yeah, that's all right, but I'll come back. Do you think there's such thing as too much pro-social behavior? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. No, and, and don't, I'm not saying anything as crude as selfish, bad, pro-social, good. I'm gonna say something cruder. Increases social welfare, good. Decreases social welfare, bad. And it just turns out that sometimes selfishness is a great way to increase social welfare. So there are lots of contracting relationships where appealing to selfishness is the best way to get the job done. And this might be Adam Smith's butcher and baker or making widgets or when, when you're asking someone to do productive activities where it's really easy to observe what they're doing and you can accurately tie the rewards to what they're doing, relying on selfishness is great. Um, it just doesn't work in these highly uncertain, complex relational contracting circumstances. And that's where I would prefer to rely on pro-sociality. So I think a key message, and certainly one I emphasize in my book or try to emphasize is, the key is to look for where selfishness is our best tool and where conscience is our best tool and use the correct tool for the job. So thank you for asking that question. You mentioned shareholder democracy. Yeah. You're not a fan of it. But I'm just wondering if institutional investors, for example, were to twig into some of your insights here, they might s start to say we're going to favor investments in companies that understand these alternatives to incentive. Perhaps that might happen. That That's way. a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I'll send my draft to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they, they could have the impact on this. Yeah, no, they, they could. And, and in some ways, it, if we look at it from a real cold calculating public choice perspective you know who would be in favor and who would be against it's really interesting the people who would support the return to all incentives uh, the alternatives to incentives would be all the hr people i know because i was just down in washington talking to the you know the head of their trade group um, it would be hopefully all of the informed investors um, uh, and it might be boards of directors who might like, then again, oh, and definitely compensation consultants, because this gives them much more room to come in. I mean, if there's one ideal formula for compensating people, that doesn't leave a lot of room for consulting hours by, you know, a consult, a executive comp consulting firm, but this allows them to build plenty of hours. Um, the people who don't want to do this are the executives now, the genies who've gotten out of the bottle, who are enriching themselves due to this philosophy, and frankly, Lucian Bebchuk and Jesse Fried, right? Who've built, I mean, I'm gonna use them as stand-ins for academics who have built a career, and Mike Jensen and Kevin Murphy, who have built careers on arguing that you have to have optimal contracting to motivate people. So it's an interesting lineup, I think, of, of forces, and thank you for that suggestion. I should go talk to the people. Um, one, of the, one of the best piece of advice I ever got, I got from the, the then head of the Sloan Foundation, and he said, it's very hard for people to understand an idea that's not in their interest. <laughs> so what you need to do if you have a new idea is find the people who have an interest in understanding it. <laughs> and that's a good, yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you. Yes. So I'm wondering what you think about another idea, um, and this is an idea that proposes to take some, as I understand mm -hmm. it anyways, to take some of the temptations off the table. Yeah. So Roger Martin argues that pay structure should not allow executive compensation to be tied to the future performance of stocks mm -hmm. because it's, it provides too many incentives to try and manipulate the stock price, which yeah. has nothing to do with corporate yeah. performance. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think Roger Martin, uh, first of all, I think Roger Martin's fabulous. I think he's entirely right. <laughs> he's going to give me a blurb on my next book. <laughs> so as far, I would never say anything neg negative about Roger Martin. But out of self-interest and out of <laughs> altruism. No, he's, he's absolutely right. He's actually looked at his, you're talking about Fixing the Game? Yeah. Which is a great book. Um, which is, in some ways, he's looking at the particular problem associated with a particular form of pay for performance, which is pay for performance based on stock prices. Because as he points out, if the market's even somewhat efficient, stock market prices are, are determined by expectations. And so what does that mean? Suppose you've got the most efficient company in the world and you're the best CEO in the world, you're never going to be able to raise stock price. 
because the stock price is already based on the assumption that you're the best company in the world and the best CEO in the world. So you know what you have to do if you want to get your options to be worth something? You have to make the stock price vary. And it's only by having a bad quarter that you can reset expectations at a lower point so that you can then move the stock price up and get your bonus. So, I mean, it's a related, but in its own way, actually far more clever and insightful point. And I think he's dead right about it. Yeah. Well, we are just about at the end of our time. Yeah. So I'd like to thank you once again for a really interesting and stimulating talk. Yeah, well, no, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to, to get such great questions. And if anyone wants to stay around, there's still cookies, and I haven't had any yet.